नमस्ते स्टूडेंट्स इन्फेक्शंस ऑफ द बोन बाय माइक्रो ऑर्गेनिज्म इज कॉल्ड ऑस्टियोमाइलाइटिस कन्वेंशनली एन अनक्वालिफाइड टर्म ऑस्टियोमाइलाइटिस इज यूज्ड फॉर इन्फेक्शंस ऑफ द बोन बाय पायोजेनिक ऑर्गेनिज्म्स ऑस्टियोमाइलाइटिस कैन बी एक्यूट और क्रॉनिक टुडे we are going to study acute osteomyelitis and we are going to study this acute osteomyelitis on following points the first point we will discuss is the relevant anatomy second the etiopathogenesis third clinical features investigations and diagnosis fourth differential diagnosis and finally the treatment and the complications now if you look at the anatomy the metaphysis of a long bone if you can see in this particular uh, picture i'll show you the metaphysis this is the metaphysis and here this is a very highly vascular zone from the diaphysis the medullary vessels they reach up to the epiphyseal plate and which is the greatest area of greatest activity and then it branches into capillaries the venous system begins in this area and drains towards the diaphysis as you can see here and thus the vessels in this particular zone they are arranged in the form of a loop or we, what we can call it as a hairpin bent arrangement the blood vessel the because of this particular hairpin bent arrangement the blood stasis occurs and it results in uh, the allowing the microorganisms circulating into the blood to come out of the vessel and lodge in this particular area so we can say that the blood stasis resulting from such an arrangement that is hairpin arrangement is probably responsible for the metaphysis being the favorite site for the bacteria to settle and thus it's a common site for the osteomyelitis now in most of the joints the capsule is attached at the junction of epiphysis and metaphysis you can see here the capsule is attached at the junction and that means the metaphysis most of the time remains extra capsular or extra articular however in some joints like hip joint and the shoulder joint part of the metaphysis is intraarticular so that the infection from the metaphysis can now spread to the joint directly resulting in to the pyogenic arthritis now the coming to the etiopathogenesis staphylococcus aureus is the commonest causative organism others are streptococcus and pneumococcus these organisms they reach the bone via the blood circulation as we have already seen primary focus of infection is generally not detectable the bacteria as they pass through the bone get lodged into the metaphysis lower femoral metaphysis is the commonest site the other common sites are the upper tibial upper femoral and upper humeral metaphysis now the pathology is as the host bone initiates the inflammatory reaction in response to the bacteria now this leads to the bone destruction and production of inflammatory exudate and cells we call it as pus once sufficient pus forms in the medullary cavity it spreads in various direction 
So first direction is always the medullary cavity itself. The pus trickles along the medullary cavity and causes thrombosis of the venous and the arterial medullary vessels. Blood supply to a segment of the bone is thus cut off. Now secondly, out of cortex. So as you can see here, pus travels along the Volkmann's canal. These are the Volkmann's canal and comes to lie subperiosteally. You can see here, resulting in damage to the periosteal supply, blood supply of that part of the bone. Now a segment of bone is thus rendered avascular. We call it as sequestrum. Dimensions of this segment, that is the avascular segment or the sequestrum, may vary from a small invisible piece to the whole diaphysis of the bone. Pus under the periosteum generates subperiosteal new bone, we call it as the periosteal reaction, and later this newly formed bone is called as involucrum. Now the pus under the periosteum eventually perforates the periosteum and letting the pus come into the muscular plane or the subcutaneous plane where now it can be filled as an abscess. The abscess if undetected or if unattended burst out of the skin forming the discharging sinus. In other directions, as we can see here, towards the physial plate, the, usually the epiphyseal plate is resistant to the spread of the pus. At times, it may be affected by the inflammatory process. The capsular attachment of the epiphysis at the epiphysis metaphyseal junction, it usually prevents the pus from entering into the nearby joint. In joints with an intraarticular metaphysis, as I have told you already, for example, the hip joint and the proximal shoulder joint, the shoulder joint, the pus can now spread into the joint and can cause the acute pyogenic arthritis. Coming to the diagnosis of acute osteomyelitis. The diagnosis of acute osteomyelitis is basically clinical. It is a disease of a childhood, more common in boys, probably because they are more prone to injuries. Presenting complaints, usually the child presents with an acute onset of pain and swelling at the end of a bone associated with systemic features of infection like fever, etc. Often, the parents attribute symptoms to an episode of injury, but the injury is coincidental. One may find a primary focus of infection elsewhere in the body like tonsils or the skin infection. On examination, the child is febrile and dehydrated with classic signs of redness heat etc localized to the metaphyseal area of the bone. In later stages, one may find an abscess in the muscle or subcutaneous plane. There may be swelling of the adjacent joint because of either the sympathetic effusion or concomitant arthritis. Investigation wise, Investigations provide few clues in the early phase of the disease, very few clues. In blood investigation, there may be the polymorphic nuclear leukocytosis and elevated ESR. A blood culture at the peak of the fever, mind well, you have to take the blood samples at the peak of the fever. That means whenever child is having an episode of high grade fever with chills and rigors. You know, that is the time when you need to take the blood uh, sample for the blood culture. Now, a blood culture at the peak of the fever may yield the causative organism. The earliest sign to appear on the X-ray 
is the periosteal reaction that is a new bone formation as you can see here the periosteum is elevated and new bone is being formed now it takes about 7 to 10 days to appear bone scan a bone scan using technetium 99 may show increased uptake by the bones in the metaphysis now this is positive before changes appear on the x-rays this may be indicated in a very early case where the diagnosis is in the doubt indium 111 labeled leukocyte scan is most specific for diagnosis of the bone infections coming to the differential diagnosis any acute inflammatory disease at the end of a bone in a child should be taken as acute osteomyelitis unless proved otherwise please remember this dictum any acute inflammatory disease at the end of a bone in a child should be taken as acute osteomyelitis unless proved otherwise now following are the some of the differential diagnosis to be considered the first and most important is the acute septic arthritis now this can be differentiated from the acute osteomyelitis from the following features of the arthritis the first thing is the tenderness and swelling is localized to the joint now look at this particular picture the swelling tenderness everything is localized to the joint rather than at the metaphysis this is the metaphysis this is the joint second the movement of the joints are very painful and child won't allow you to move the joint if it is a pyogenic arthritis in case of doubt now you can even aspirate the joint fluid as you can see in this particular picture under aseptic conditions and the fluid examined for the inflammatory cells the second important differential diagnosis is the acute rheumatic arthritis now as you can see in this particular diagram the features in acute rheumatic arthritis are very similar to the acute septic arthritis however the fleeting character of the joint pain elevated aso teeter and crp values helps in the diagnosis you know in rheumatic fever it is always a fleeting type of arthritis one joint gets swollen then it is relieved another joint gets swollen like that so the next differential diagnosis is scurvy now there is formation of subperiosteal hematomas in scurvy this may mimic acute osteomyelitis radiologically but the relative absence of pain tenderness and fever points to the diagnosis of scurvy of course there may be other features of scurvy like swollen bleeding gingivas or gums right so there may be other features of the malnutrition as well now the last most important differential diagnosis is the acute poliomyelitis now in case of in the acute phase of poliomyelitis there is fever and muscles are tender but there is no tenderness on the bones now patient parents often tends to relude, relate an episode of injury to the onset of symptom in any musculoskeletal pain this is most important please i will repeat parents often tend to relate an episode of an injury to onset of symptoms in any musculoskeletal pain now this may give a wrong lead and a novice may make a diagnosis of a fracture or soft tissue injury often such patients are immobilized in plaster cast only to know, know later that the infection was the cause and any history of trauma particularly in children must be thoroughly questioned for this particular reason now coming to the treatment part early adequate treatment 
of acute osteomyelitis is the key to success. The child is admitted and investigated. Treatment depends upon the duration of illness after which the child is brought to you. Now the cases can be arbitrarily divided into two groups. The first group is if the child is brought to you within 48 hours of the onset of the symptom. Now if the child is brought to you early, it is supposed that pus has not yet formed and the inflammatory process can be halted by systemic antibiotics. Treatment consists of rest, antibiotics and general buildup of the patient. The limb is put to rest in a splint or by traction. Choice of antibiotic varies from center to center. It broadly depends upon the age of a child and choice of the doctor. Now in children less than four months of age, a combination of septraxion and vancomycin in appropriate dose is preferred. In older children, a combination of septraxone and cloxacillin is given. Antibiotics are started only after taking the blood for culture and sensitivity and antibiotics are changed to specific one depending upon the culture and sensitivity report. Now, apart from this, the child is adequately rehydrated with intravenous fluids. Response to the above treatment is evaluated by frequent assessment of the patient. A four hourly temperature chart and pulse record is maintained. It is a good idea to outline the area of local tenderness precisely with the help of a back of a matchstick over regular interval. If patient responds favorably, fever will start declining and local inflammatory signs will diminish. Now as the child improves, the limb can be mobilized. Weight bearing is restricted for six to eight weeks. No, no weight bearing. Why? Because the pathology, because of the pathology, the bone has weakened, and if you allow weight bearing, there may be a pathological fracture. Now, after two weeks of anti IV antibiotics, now the antibiotics can be administered by oral route for next six weeks. Now, if the patient does not respond favorably, within 48 hours of starting the treatment, remember, surgical intervention is required. Again, I will repeat, if the patient does not respond favorably, within 48 hours of starting the treatment, surgical intervention is required. Now, the second group is, if the child is brought to you after 48 hours of the onset of symptom. Now, if the child is brought late or if he does not respond to conservative treatment as just we have discussed, it is taken for granted that there is already a collection of pus within or outside the bone. Detection of pus is often difficult by clinical examination because it may lie deep to the periosteum and in this particular situation an ultrasound examination of the affected part may help in early detection of deep collection of the pus. Now surgical exploration and drainage is the mainstay of treatment at this particular stage. Now what do you do in the surgical management? A drill hole is made in the bone in the region of a metaphysis. If pus wells up from the drill hole, the hole is enlarged until free drainage is obtained. A swab is taken for culture and sensitivity. The wound is closed over a sterile suction drain. Rest, antibiotics 
and hydration. Rest, antibiotics and hydration are continued post-operatively. Gradually, the inflammation is controlled and the limb is then put to use. Antibiotics are continued for over six weeks. Coming to the complication part. Now this can again be divided into two types, general and local. General complications. In the early stage, the child may develop septicemia and pyemia. Either complication, if left uncontrolled, may prove fetal. Local complications. It is unfortunate that a large number of cases of acute osteomyelitis in the developing countries develop serious complications. And most of these are because of delay in diagnosis and inadequate treatment. Now some of the common complications are as follows. One, chronic osteomyelitis. It is the commonest complication of acute osteomyelitis. There are hardly any radiological features seen in the early stages. A delay in diagnosis leads to sequestrum formation and pent up pus in cavities inside the bone. Poor host resistance is another reason for the chronicity of the disease. The second local complication is the acute pyogenic arthritis. Now, this occurs in a joint where metaphysis is intraarticular, for example, the hip, the upper femoral metaphysis, or the shoulder, the upper humeral metaphysis, etc. The third local complication is a pathological fractures. Now, this occurs through a bone which has been weakened by a disease or by the window made during the surgery. It can be avoided by adequate splinting the limb, adequately splinting the limb. And the fourth important complication is the growth plate disturbance. Now, it may be damaged, that is the growth plate may be damaged, leading to either complete or partial cessation of the growth. Or sometimes there may be hypergrowth. So this may give rise to either shortening, lengthening or deformity of the limb. Now in our next lecture, we will study about the chronic osteomyelitis. And before we end today, let us have a thought for the day. What does it say? Jab aap dousro ke liye achcha chaate hain, to wahi achchi chije aapke jeevan mein bhi wapas aati hain. यही प्रकृति का नियम है फिर से कहो जब आप दूसरों के लिए अच्छा चाहते हैं तो वही अच्छी चीजें आपके जीवन में वापस आती है यही प्रकृति का नियम है थैंक यू थैंक यू वेरी मच फॉर योर पेशेंट लिसनिंग इफ यू हैव लाइक दिस पर्टिकुलर वीडियो प्लीज डू लाइक इट शेयर इट एंड सब्सक्राइब इट Thank you. Thank you very much.